The Locked On Podcast Network presents The Big Six in 60. The six biggest national sports stories from the local experts of the Locked On Podcast Network. Get the real story. Why it matters, what's next, who wins the big game, and more. All in 60 minutes. The Big Six in 60 starts now with the biggest story in sports. Walktober is here. The Dodgers are two wins away from the World Series. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. More fun to be a Dodger fan when they're doing what they did in game three in Queens on Wednesday, which is win. And now the Dodgers are up 2-1 in the series. They're two wins away from getting back to the World Series for the first time since 2020. And it was a fun. It was a, a you know a stressful game, obviously, early on. And then the Dodgers just continued to, to push and push and push. And, you know, until Tani broke it open all the way there with a big three-run blast and then going up 7-0. And then you could probably feel a little bit more comfortable. At, uh, Max Muncy adds one more on top of that to make it 8-0. And, uh, Dodgers now have uh, another shutout in the books, another another shutout in the books. And who started that shutout? None other than Walker Bueller. Uh, you know, Walktober didn't sound that great because it sounds like you're walking guys, but uh, it, it does combine his name and it does combine October. And that's what we sometimes do in the media these days uh, when there's big things coming in. Yeah, Walker Bueller, it, it, kind of funny how yesterday we talked about Bueller or me specifically talking about Bueller, how he wasn't going to walk that many guys. He's going to attack hitters. He wasn't going to nibble. And, and that's the way he was going to get things done and, and still be effective. And then Walker Bueller decided to flip the script a little bit in the sense of he did have strikeout stuff. I don't know if he was nibbling or just didn't have full command and control of everything that was going, but he looked a lot different than he had in the last couple of starts. And, and, just as effective or, or actually way more effective uh, compared to his last start, uh, his, his the last regular season start, he was very effective. But Walker Bueller, I mean, we we put our trust in him because he does come through in big games. And, you know, he he got let down by his defense a little bit in, in the last postseason start against the Padres, but still was able to push through and give the Dodgers five innings in a time that they needed length. And this time didn't quite give them the length, but gave them the quality in terms of not giving up any runs. Six strikeouts, 18 swings and misses. It was something we haven't seen from Bueller uh, in a while. And, and he talked about he talked about a little bit post game of just like how, how he wanted to attack. And he gave a lot of credit to Will Smith. And, and he said Smith is probably the most in sync he's been with the Dodgers pitching staff. Uh, in the postseason and, and maybe ever. And, and you know, it's hard to disagree with all these shutouts that are getting pitching and all the different pitchers that are taking them out and all that type of stuff. So it, it was good on that end. But, you know, we'll, we'll start with Bueller and just some of the stuff that he did have, like I said, 18 swings and misses, not some we've, we've seen from him before, but it was a little bit different than we've seen before in terms of the movement. His velocity as a whole uh, was down slightly, not much. Uh, the fastball and the sweeper, we're down a full mile per hour from his season average. Everything else was down less than a full mile per hour. But the vertical break, the horizontal break, was all up on some of his off-speed pitches. He had uh, more vertical break on the sweeper, more horizontal break on the sweeper. He had more uh, horizontal break on the sinker that he threw. He had a little bit more vertical break on the knuckle curve. He had a little bit more horizontal break on there. Uh, and the cutter actually had a little bit less movement, so it looked more, played a little bit more like a fastball. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was great to see because you know he did get into trouble, and that, and that's where the efficiency part came in. He did get you know into the ninety pitches in those four innings. That's why he didn't go any more than that. But it was worth it, worth it getting those zeros, putting those zeros up. He did load the bases there in the second inning and got back to back strikeouts to get out of it, and that's something that. I didn't expect from Walker Bueller and, and from what we've seen this year, not necessarily something we could affect, uh, uh, you know, think that he was going to do because we, he's had the good stuff to get ahead in the count. Hasn't had the put away stuff. And for, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen his full interview post game. If they asked him if there was something different about today of why his off speed pitches had so much more movement, 
But when his pitches have that type of movement, and I'm sure, you know, maybe a little bit more movement than he even wanted, which is why he maybe wasn't as efficient and, and uh, you know, not quite getting the strikes on the corner and letting the Mets kind of watch a few pitches. Uh, but I think that was the big part of it where his pitches were nasty. Like the, the, the sweeper looked nasty. The knuckle curve looked nasty. You know, the sinker had movement. And, and he threw all of them uh, a handful of times. I mean, he, he mixed it up pretty well. 24 fastballs, 21 sweepers. 16 knuckle curves, 16 cutters, 13 sinkers. Uh, in terms of swings and misses, three on the fastball, six on the sweeper, six on the knuckle curve, two on the cutter, one on the sinker. And in terms of called strikes, six on the four seam, one on the sweeper, three on the knuckle curve, three on the cutter, four on the sinker. So if he wasn't getting you to swing and miss, he was getting you to look at it and look at a strike. And that was, you know, beneficial. The one thing we did notice from Bueller is he went to the stretch after that first batter, he went to the stretch. And, you know, it was one of those things where it might be just a matter of his mechanics were maybe off or or some that he felt or something that they maybe talked about or whatever the case was. He mentioned after the game, it was because the mound was a little it's cold out there in New York. The mound was a little tougher. Um, and when he was putting that plant foot down, he wasn't quite sure where it was going to be. And he was all over the place. So that's why he went to the stretch in order to just have that place that that thing supplanted. Uh, and and knowing exactly where it's going to be and obviously it worked because he, he he got the job done and like i said if he could combine what he did in this game with what he did in his last two starts in terms of having the control and not walking guys if he could combine those you know we're going to get a, a walker bueller in either a game seven or in a world series game that can be you know pretty dominant in the walker bueller that we've you know known to grow and love over the past few years. So it, it was great to see that. And, you know, not to just harp on Bueller, but also moving on to the bullpen. I mean, the Dodgers still had to get five innings and they still, and they got those five innings from their, their high leverage arms. He got, uh, well, other than Ben Casperi is getting the last two innings uh, because the Dodgers had put it out, put it uh, out of control and, and out of the way. So, you know, Michael Kopech comes in, faces the top of the order, gets the job done. You had Blake Trinan who looked pretty filthy, uh, you had, who else did you have? You had, uh, well, Ryan Brazier didn't look great, but got a big ground ball, double play to end the inning. Um, then you had Ben Casperius who got the job done, and, and they all put up zeros, and they got to a shutout. And I think the biggest part is, like, for a game four, Kopech threw, I think, 11, 12 pitches. You had Trinan, you know, threw not that many pitches. You still have Daniel Hudson available. Uh, you still have Banda available. You still have Evan Phillips available. Like, all the main guys are available. So shout out to the offense for – you know, allowing the the Dodgers to get through those last two innings with Ben Casperius, save their big arms for this game. And, you know, now it looks a lot different this series than, than it did after game two because you have Yoshinobi Yamamoto going in game four. You have Jack Flaherty more than likely going in game five. And you, you might have the pitch or you should have the pitching advantage, at least starting pitching in both of those games. You should have the bullpen advantage in the sense of, you know, your, your two of your high leverage arms didn't go too much and the other two of your high leverage arms didn't pitch at all in game three. And, you know, you have a full force to go in that game four and, you know, to, to really put the pressure on the Mets and also, you know, make yourself feel a lot more comfortable. At the very least, the Dodgers can't lose this series in New York now. They If the, you know, if, if all goes wrong the next two days, they'll come back home to Los Angeles and they can win it here. So big game three win. Uh, the stat they kept mentioning on the broadcast and on the radio was that the winner of a game three in a 1-1 series uh, goes on to win 69% of the time, 68% of the time. One of those, uh, the Dodgers are looking to make it, you know, a little bit more percentage there. So, Hey, NFL fans, you can get a big return on FanDuel America's number one sports book as we head into the meet of the NFL season. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, speaking of the middle, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place that first $5 bet. You can take aim at week seven in the NFL, the first game of the week between the Broncos and Saints has New Orleans as home dogs. FanDuel has the Broncos two and a half point favorites in this one, FanDuel. Has zero faith in these offenses too. The total is set at 36 and a half. That is, if you if you didn't know, that's low. That's that's like almost Iowa football low. So what are you waiting for? That's FanDuel.com to get started. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? 
have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you canvas analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On NFL Crossover, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Uh, this one all comes down to the rookie quarterbacks, man. This is and the young offenses all of a sudden. Yeah, this is the rookie quarterback matchup. I think everybody's been waiting for it. Forget next weekend, right? With <laughs> Jaden cares? Daniels and Caleb Williams. This is the one that everybody <laughs> wants to see. I know it. I'm sure of it. But I'm excited for it because, look, I mean, Broncos country, very much uh, everybody's got an opinion about Bo Nix, and it's all on the extreme side. Nobody's being overly patient because Broncos country, Ross, has never, I mean, we've never really experienced the team developing after drafting a quarterback. Like Jay Cutler, yeah. he was kicked out of there when Josh McDaniels came in, and so it, it's really never happened. It's always been the retread guys, and so this is another opportunity for him to come out there and impress, and it just so happens to be in the place where Sean Payton had all of his success <laughs> as a head coach with Drew Brees in the house of all people. Right, man. Yeah, it's going to be a very emotional matchup. And as you know, the New Orleans Saints with Sean Payton, the very same, not really a, a team that has drafted and developed quarterbacks. It was always the free agent. It was Drew Brees. It was Teddy Bridgewater. It was Jameis Winston, the only uh, quarterback that Sean Payton really developed here from you know, a, a rookie status situation was Taysom Hill. He didn't even develop him as a quarterback. Developed him as literally everything else over on the offensive side. So it, it's it's it, a wildly, we were talking about kind of how the stars aligned in this one, right? Like uh, before we started recording, Drew Brees being in the house, Sean Payton returning to New Orleans, rookie quarterback on one side, rookie quarterback on the other side, Sean Payton's former defensive coordinator, the head coach here in New Orleans, like all of these pieces have aligned for what should be a very exciting matchup. So let's keep rolling on the, the, the young offenses and the rookie quarterback side of it. Tell us a little bit about how this all happened for Denver, the young offense, what you're expecting from it. Like, like what's kind of the big story around that young offense, right? Well, I think Sean Payton is really just kind of committed to the cause in a way. When you talk about going with <laughs> yeah. the youth movement, it's really you've seen it at just about every position group on the offensive line, starting with obviously the quarterback and Bo Nix. But I think we'll see this week, we'll see it extend to the running back position where Sean Payton said deliberately after the game on Sunday, right after the Chargers lost, he's like, I want to see more estimate. He's talking about the fifth round pick out of Notre Dame, mm. who should get some run out of the backfield. Devon Vele, seventh round pick that nobody had ever heard of going into the NFL draft. He led the team in receiving last week and Troy Franklin caught his first touchdown pass. So it's really an exciting time when you talk about a youth movement, you talk about guys kind of showing themselves and proving themselves. And I think this game against New Orleans is kind of a fun situation where Sean is going to get to go out there and kind of show the New Orleans fan base, you know, all of his, it's like a show and tell, you know, for him with all right. these new toys that he's gotten. So we'll see how it ends up. But that's hopefully the plan going forward is that this team really sticks to that youth movement. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there's some elements of that uh, for New Orleans, too. The thing that I'm so interested about for Sean, by the way, is what is it like standing on the other sideline? Yeah. He's never been there. Like, he's never stood yeah. on that sideline during a game. And he thought that was so interested in what that's going to be like. But I, I, the, the Saints are kind of in a similar situation, though. Though The difference is that they, they're kind of having their hand forced into this youth movement. Uh, but they probably won't stick with the youth movement, right? Because it's a lot of injury stuff. Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid, the top two wide receivers for the team, out for this week. Derek Carr, of course, he's listed as doubtful on the injury report. He ain't playing. He's he's out. Um, then you've got you know young, you've got youth that you know, on your offensive line already with uh, the rookie starting left tackle, and then you have a right tackle who is over there for the first time in his career, so on and so forth. So like you have all of this youth as well over in New Orleans, but it's kind of come out of necessity in a way. But the thing that I'm looking at, kind of how they're going to get a look at sort of the the young running backs over in or the young running back over in Denver here in New Orleans you're looking at Bub Means and you're looking at uh, Mason Tipton two rookie wide receivers one of which drafted the fifth round the other undrafted coming out of Yale 
respectively, Bub Means, the fifth round out of Pittsburgh, and then uh, Mason Tipton being the Yale UDFA. Uh, and those are the two guys that are going to kind of be the field stretchers, the deep threats, the filling the role that wide receiver Rashid Shahid has filled pretty much most of the year as the big home run hitter. Uh, he might He's out indefinitely at the moment. Nobody knows until after he gets a, a meniscus surgery done in Los Angeles. So the Saints doing the same thing. And then, of course, Spencer Rattler, right? Spencer Rattler versus Bo Nix. Like that's kind of going to be the other headline in this one, aside from the return home for Sean Payton and the uh, Saints Hall of Fame induction at halftime for Drew Brees. Yeah, and I know that Sean Payton really, really liked Spencer yeah. Rattler in the pre-draft process, and he had some complimentary things to say about him early in the week this week as in the lead up to this game, obviously. But I, I, I know we can't go back and redo everything, but I do believe that if if Sean had not got Bo Nix in the first round, I think he would have taken Spencer Rattler mm. on day two if he had gotten the chance. The Broncos really did like him a lot and thought highly of him just in, in what he showed in that pre-draft interview. So, And I think Spencer thought it went really well as well. I remember writing a couple articles at the time of he was like, man, I really felt good about my meeting with the Broncos, felt like they really liked me, things like that. So it's going to be a fascinating matchup from that vantage point. Two guys, this, uh, I believe the first primetime game for both of these young mm -hmm. players that they're starting in as well so you get under the lights you get a short week in the nfl yeah. you know, bo nix mentioned that he's never played on a short week like this so yep. it's going to be fascinating from so many different vantage points i wouldn't be shocked everybody out there in broncos country i think expected to be perfect each week wouldn't be shocked if it's a little sloppy out there ross oh yeah oh yeah dude it's going to be a sloppy game like <laughs> when you've got two rookie quarterbacks it's going to be sloppy but that's okay like the biggest thing around those guys in particular is are they a little bit better than they were the week before and i think that's that's where both of these defenses have to present uh, the appropriate challenges, right? Spencer Rattler really uh, struggled under pressure last week, 33.3% completion percentage, 19.7 or 19.8. I can't remember which one, sorry, but just over 19 in terms of his passer rating. So not great under pressure, but look, that's part of what this is going to be right now. When you got rookie quarterbacks going, I assume uh, Bo Nix has had the things that he's been really, really solid at and the things that he struggled with as well. Absolutely. I think a lot of people are wondering, like, is he going to be able to kind of have that quicker trigger like we saw at mm -hmm. Oregon? Or is he going to continue to hold on to the ball and or maybe look to scramble at first? Because he's kind of had that instinct in him to, you know, if if the first read's not there, kind of get a little happy feet in the pocket, maybe not have the best mechanics with the footwork and things like that. So that's something that Broncos country is really looking forward to seeing is Bo trusting his eyes out there, trusting that receivers that they're scheming open, that they're going to come open and that he can throw them open as well. So uh, it, it's not always about that first or second even read. It's it's all yeah. about making sure you go through the progressions and you know looking off the safeties, all those little things that everybody, you know, we microanalyze things at times, but they are those things that, man, they could ultimately be the thing that helps him grow to be the player that I know Sean Payton believes he can be. Yeah, absolutely. You see something very similar with Spencer Rattler. Some of the best plays that he made last week were when the play broke down, the fourth, fifth read, right? The second route being run by those, those pass catchers. And that's going to be big, I think, for both of these guys because it's going to come down to the challenges that they're presented by the a defense that's lining up across from Super Bowl rematch. You are locked on NFL crossover, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. The 49ers and the Chiefs haven't played their optimal ball right now. The 49ers had a big win, had a little mini buy coming off a Thursday nighter at the Seattle Seahawks. Those road Thursday games are tough, and that was a huge one. That was the biggest game of the season for the 49ers so far, and might you know turn out to be the biggest game because uh, if you want to get back to the Super Bowl, which the 49ers want to do, you got to win your division. Uh, that helps, and so the 49ers are back on that path at three and three, even though they haven't quite played their best ball. Um, you know, week one, week six might have been their two best games of the season so far. You know, they thumped the the New England Patriots, but kind of everyone's doing that right now. And then they're they're not a very good football team, so not much of a litmus test there. Um, but the the Chiefs, even though maybe not playing optimal ball, they're still five and zero, and they still find a way to win. And it's funny because a lot of what we see we've seen in both Super Bowls, 49ers able to get leads and then kind of just not finishing the job, and the Kansas City Chiefs. Seem like they're always able, no matter what the the conversation is around the team, whether they're, ah, we're still trying to figure out what's going on at wide receiver. Shea Rice is out now. Um, it led by the defense more than Mahomes' offense being the juggernaut for the Kansas City Chiefs. It's, it's a lot of the same conversations we were talking about going into the Super Bowl, Chris. And 
and you know my, my listeners and uh, a lot of people that break down the San Francisco 49ers like okay well maybe this is when you can get the Chiefs because you know things uh, aren't exactly uh, right on offense right now but it's like we just went through this right and so it's kind of a very similar vibe for these two teams in my opinion right now as they meet in, in week seven no it, it really is and I think the big thing is uh, nothing to throw shade at this game it's a it's a big game the Chiefs are looking at this as their biggest game of the season so far and maybe their biggest game that they're going to have this season but I also will say that I do think that this team plays different in the regular season than they play in the postseason so uh it, this maybe is the right time to get Kansas City right they don't have their offense going the, the way you would want it to uh but you know they're dealing with injuries I mean you know their top two wide receivers are down their you know top running back is down uh right now you're in a situation where you're just trying to figure out how you're going to continue to move the ball and score points and you're doing it with guys that's uh you know like Juju Smith-Schuster who was gone the last time these teams played in the Super Bowl uh, and he'd been in New England for a year, and he comes back and has a huge game, la you know, in week five to help them win that game against New Orleans. I think that that's going to continue, and, and they're going to have to continue to address and, and move things in the right in the right way. I will say this: Andy Reid, I believe, is twenty four and three coming at, off a bye, so I do think that that plays into how this game is going to play out. This is going to be a great game, though. The, the 49ers, I agree with you. I think they look a lot better than they did uh, in their other games that you know they've kind of struggled in. And, and Kansas City has now had a, two weeks to basically get prepared for this game and uh, kind of you know self-scout themselves to have an idea as to what is going on right now and, and how they can address it. I mean, and, and Reed and Spagnuolo are no joke, and, and I've talked about this with the 49ers, and I think they do an awesome job against Kyle Shanahan's offense. And, and uh, in a lot of ways, I think Kyle could learn from those two veteran coaches in the nfl and even though kyle's a veteran coach it's really it's it's really interesting how similar early career andy reed who was the coach that couldn't win the big one yep. is kind of what kyle shanahan has become right now and you hope you don't have to wait until kyle's 60 years old to to get that lombardi for the 49ers well uh, and somewhere else that I mean, would be the other thing team, right exactly if it if it holds up and he's the andy the eagles version of andy reed with the 49ers um but uh so talking about the the storylines there and, and i kind of brought up that offense and how things are going um the questions i have for you with this team is how have the chiefs in the secondary replaced the big loss like legerius sneed and then on the offensive side of the ball um you know who is who is the number one now at wide receiver like how how is that offense running when you don't have your number one running back and you don't have your number one wide receiver uh, now for the rest of the season yeah, and that's a great question. I think one thing that I would say is that it's, uh, Travis Kelsey, I think everybody thought that he was maybe washed to start the season. I think that he's come on the past couple of weeks and really since uh, Rasheed Rice went down and shown that he's not a washed player. He is a guy that can still uh, you know, have his way against teams and and really take advantage of, of zone defenses and take advantage of guys trying to play a man and uh, using his ability to get free. So I think when you look at what they're going to do and, and how they're attacking things, I think that Travis Kelsey has always truly been their number one target. Uh, number one receiver right now, uh, probably I would say Xavier Worthy, although I think you could make an argument that maybe Juju steps into that role at least temporarily for a couple of weeks until Worthy gets a little bit more acclimated to the offense and into the NFL. Uh, the thing that I would say about Worthy is he's further ahead than – Rasheed Rice was last year. I'm not trying to say he's going to have the same season that Rice had, but he is further along than, he, than Rice was at this point last year. So I think that's a, a positive. And you look at Legereus Sneed, uh, he's not playing great in, in Tennessee. And I don't think that that's necessarily just on Sneed. I think part of that's the defense and the way Spagnuolo was using him. But they've had a guy in Jalen Watson who's come in, who's come back from injury and played pretty much lights out the entire season. Uh, I'm not going to say that he is an all pro. But he is playing at a very, very high level and a guy that is probably playing close to maybe a, a couple steps down, a, a couple small steps down from like a Trent McDuffie type, which uh, obviously that's the Chiefs other corner. So you have those two types of guys as your corners. I think you got to feel pretty good about who you're going up against. That's why the coaching is so important. You get the the New England Patriots vibes, you know, because remember New England Patriots would, you know, not pay famously a, a bunch of players on defense and then they would go somewhere else and. Oh yeah, you know what? That guy doesn't look as good anymore as he did when he was 
uh, on the New England Patriots. And then the Patriots yeah. would magically find another guy that would fill in and look awesome again. And, and we're seeing that right now with Spagnuolo's defense with the Chiefs. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and you look at Juju. I mean, Juju is a great example. that He had a good year in Kansas City, didn't do anything with New England, came back. I'm not so sure that we're not going to see MVS on this roster. It may not be this week. It may end up being next week or the week after. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if MVS is starting on this team by week 10 or 11 uh, and you know, coming back after not having much of an impact in Buffalo uh, just because I think that he can step in and help the offense. And that's definitely something they're going to need at, at the receiver position. You mentioned Xavier Worthy, and I got to imagine for a rookie, things come at you fast in the NFL. He has five games, then you can sit back, bye week. Uh, you know, Andy Reid can kind of figure out how they want to do things here. And I, I just have a big feeling that Xavier Worthy is going to be a big factor in this game. They're going to try to find ways to get the ball in his hands and utilize his athletic ability and probably having a bye week before this game gives them a big opportunity to find other ways to maybe get in the ball rather than the natural flow of the game. Yeah, no, and I can't disagree with you on that. Uh, I, I do think that they're going to get him more involved, and I think that's going to be something they're going to have to do uh, throughout the rest of the season is, is he has to become that guy that's going to be more than just a field stretcher because at this point, they don't have a choice. Uh, Justin Watson isn't going to get it done. He can't be a, a guy that's going to be a you know six, seven, eight target guy. You're going to need somebody on the offense that can do that. Juju may be able to have a couple of games like that, but I don't expect that he can do that the entire season. So you're going to have to have somebody to step up, and I think Worthy is going to be that guy this year for the Chiefs. Uh, and obviously you're wishing that they had Hollywood Brown and Rasheed Rice, but at this point you got to move on and try to do the best that you can with what you have. Oh, you still got Patrick Mahomes over there. Uh, That's and, true. Uh, who, by the way, is not the highest graded quarterback in the league, according to Pro Football Focus. That belongs to uh, Brock Purdy right now. So yep. put a check mark on the, the quarterback side for the San Francisco 49ers in this one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Picks filters out the fluff to show you only the incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports, concerts, comedy, theater, and more near you. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Vikings. Your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. By talking about probably the biggest headline going into this game, uh, there's a, been a little bit of like sort of moving stuff around on the margins with the Vikings. They just traded for Cam Akers and other other injury news that we'll get into eventually. But the big one is no Aiden Hutchinson. He's out for the season, right? Like Dan Campbell's just being an, he's out for the season, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, yeah. you, you talk, you're talking four to six months. You're talking a broken tibia and yeah. Tibia. And you know, you, you, we, we all talked into the NFC North preview and, and you and I have talked before. I, I knew the Viking. I didn't know the Vikings going to be this good. Okay. But you I believed said, in them though. Yeah. I, I was the, I was a hater. Yes. And I said, don't sleep on them because I really like their coach and I love their D coordinator. And that, that's a better team than people will give credit for. Now this five and oh starts unreal. Here come the lions at four and one. And it almost feels like going in without Hutchinson, that there will be Aiden Hutchinson, of course, out for the year. There will mm -hmm. be some people that say, well, the lions got the road win last week in Dallas. Now I got to go on the road to Minnesota. There's no way without Hutch that they can do this. And you know, your, your original question about what happens Without him, right now, it's going to be next man up. It's going to be okay. names that you don't know. Isaiah Thomas. No, not Zeke from the Bad Boy Pistons, but the former Bengals practice squatter. Trevor Nowoski. Uh, maybe James Houston. Uh, Isaac Ukwu. Mitchell Agude. These are not names that Vikings fans know. Heck, most of the Lion fans don't know them, but the Lions are so thin at edge. Derek Barnes out for the year. 
Marcus mm. Davenport out for the year. Aiden Hutchinson out for the year. Certainly it's going to be a concern, uh, especially with the way Sam Darnold's been playing pitch and catch the first five weeks. So we'll have to see how this goes. I think for right now it's next man up, but I believe that before November 5th, trade deadline day, the Lions will pull the trigger and bring somebody else in and make a trade. The question is who? Yeah. Yeah. So they apparently they've already reached out to Hassan Reddick's team, which makes a lot of sense for them to do. We'll see if they can work something out. It's probably a little late in the week for that to affect this game. Uh, but so I, I looked at the last part of that Cowboys game after Hutch went out. And I talked about this on yesterday on Locked on Vikings and went into a whole bunch of detail. I actually think Lions fans might like it, but uh, it to me looked like they've started funneling things through Josh Pascal. How do you feel about that? Well, Josh Pascal is the one guy Pascal. that remain. Yeah, he's the one guy that really remains from the group of edge rushers. He's kind of an inside outside guy. He's lined up inside and outside. You're right. He's the one guy left. I mean, at the start of the year, it's all right. We got five edge rushers. We got Pascal Hutch, uh, Davenport, uh, Kaminsky who got hurt. And then James Houston, who really doesn't play. And they've kind of relegated him to, to being deactivated. He may be active okay. this week. We'll see. But Pascal's a good football player. And he's a guy that's going to have to play a lot of snaps. But he's your, is he your number one edge? No, he's not. Um, good player. We'll see how this goes. I, I think Aaron Glenn's going to have to scheme the heck out of it. I think they're going to be sending linebackers. They're going to be showing different looks. Um, it just hurts. I mean, this is arguably the best defensive player so far the first month and a half of the year. Uh, Hutchinson was up for defensive player of the year. He had seven and a half sacks himself. The rest of the team had seven and a half watch out as well for Aleem McNeil just got paid over 24 million a year. Mm -hmm. He's been very disruptive on the inside. They'll line up uh, at some point, Pascal and three D tackles at one time with McNeil, uh, Levi owns Arike and, and uh, DJ reader. So look for that as well. So obviously Hutchinson is not the only story on the Lions. Jamison Williams is having the breakout that was, you know, kind of promised and talked about for two years. Finally, that is coming to fruition. Um, you know, I mean, how's Jared Goff looking? Is is that all real? What about Amon Ross St. Brown? Is he getting more forgotten as uh, guys like Jamison Williams kind of explode? What about where's Sam Laporta been? He had that one flea flicker, but has otherwise been more quiet than people expected. How do you feel about this passing offense in general? And what is the shape of it? Does it look a lot different from it did last year? Well, if you have a would have asked me after week three in the Arizona game, I would have said, yeah, what's going on here? This is not the same offense. They're just not clicking. There's not that rhythm last two weeks, Seattle, the Monday night game, then the bye week. And then this past week at Dallas, I mean, they have been fantastic. It looks like the Jared Goff of 2023. It looks like the Ben Johnson of 2023 play action passing. You start with a ground game and David Montgomery pounding people four or five yards a pop. Then you throw in the change of pace with Jameer Gibbs. Then the play action passing game that leads to Jared Goff completing, by the way, 18, you know, pass passes. He has 18 completions in all of the games that they've won and has played very well. So it's just kind of a weird number including 18 for 18 against Seattle. Now that JMO's there, Luke, I, I don't think that takes away from Amon Ra. I think it did in the first game of the year. But since there's been equal distribution, okay. Laporta is interesting. Like you said, the one guy that maybe hasn't had the year so far that he had last year is Sam Laporta. I just think with time, it'll get there. Um, but right now, they feel good, and that O-line is clicking, and they moved bodies last week. Boy, they really, really pounded Dallas. Just absolutely obliterated. Yeah, oh, that was, that, that was the fun kind of disrespect. Yeah, Where, like they had a point to make. <laughs> they made that point. I mean, look, they are up forty-seven and nine, and they split Dan Skipper, their backup off the track, <laughs> out wide to run a two-yard button hook. They're running flea flickers, uh, a, a hook and ladder with Panay Sewell up thirty. Yeah, that is just straight clown show disrespect on Dallas and happy eighty-second birthday, Jerry Jones. I mean, that was just yeah. Mystery. Was it was it really on his birthday? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> In his house on his birthday, and you're Vicious. dunking on him with Dan Skipper. It was dunking. played him so much he's on the injury report now, right? <laughs> Too many He'll snaps. Be He'll be out there. Okay. I mean, okay. That's the thing. The Lions knew from last year's Dallas game that hey, Taylor Decker did report they got hosed by the refs. And so first play of the game, they you know the loudspeaker, the referee says number sixty eight and number seventy. Decker and Skipper are both reporting. Then they tried to hit Decker on a tackle <laughs> eligible play up twenty four. Ben Johnson emptied the bag. The hope is there's still some stuff in the bag for for this week. 
Well, I, I think like just putting all that stuff on tape, and then if you do want to come out in six or seven O line and run the ball all the time, um, you know, you're you've you've given everybody just that much extra to to think about. That's probably a, a little bit more of the strategy than it was just kind of going and making a point. But also, I kind of wouldn't put it past Dan Campbell <laughs> to do that. I know. So, uh, well, what what haven't I gotten at that I should probably get at yet? Like, what what about the Lions? Don't I, as somebody who doesn't follow them, know about? Is is there anybody that is, you know, sort of a name only known to Detroit that we should be keeping an eye out for here? Um, I, look, obviously, I think what's going to be interesting this week is who's guarding Justin Jefferson and how that's going to look yeah. now that Aiden Hutchinson is not going coming after Sam Darnold. And it'll be a, a, a different group of guys. Uh, and then is Carlton Davis going to be on Jefferson? If they get Jefferson matched up on Terry on Arnold, will Arnold go way too handsy and get flagged? He's been flagged a lot. I mean, he's a rookie. He's a good mm -hmm. football player. He's right there. Luke, he's right there with the receiver. He's right there by the ball. He's just handsy. And certain officiating crews. Have Classic college. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And some of it hasn't. He got better this past week against Dallas. But that's just something to watch. Brian Branch is playing really well, Defensive Player of the Week now uh, at strong safety, moving him from that kind of slot corner, nickel corner to safety. He's been good. The safeties have been great with Joseph and Branch. The linebacking crew, Jack Campbell, they've gotten better. Uh, I'm very intrigued by the run game of the Lions versus the number two run defense in the league and, and you, what you guys bring with the Vikings. That's going to be a heck of a matchup. That, so, yeah. A lot to, a lot to and we'll, we'll definitely. Yeah. Was, we'll, one more thing. Jake Bates, rookie kicker. On the road, big game, division game. How will that play out uh, this Sunday? He was perfect this past week in Dallas, but that crowd was taken out of that game very early. Guys, ever feel like you need a little boost in the bedroom? It's time you stop worrying about your performance and get hymns so you can feel confident knowing you can get hard and stay hard whenever you're in the mood. Hims is changing men's health care by providing you with access to affordable sexual health treatments from the comfort of your couch. Hims provides access to a range of doctor-trusted ED treatments like chewable hard mints and Viagra and Cialis, and their generics for up to 95% cheaper. The process is 100% online, so there's no need for uncomfortable doctor's visits. Start your free online visit today at hims.com slash locked on. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash locked on for your personalized ED treatment options. Hims.com slash locked on. The product mentions are chewable compounds that are not approved or verified for safety or effectiveness by the FDA. Prescriptions required online. Require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate restrictions apply. See website for details and important safety instructions. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked on Sports Today brings you can analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked on Bulldogs, your daily podcast on the Georgia Bulldogs. A lot of people expected that the Texas Longhorns on October 19th would be trying to knock off the number one Georgia Bulldogs. But now the script is flipped, right? The Georgia Bulldogs are trying to knock off the number one Texas Longhorns at home. So, Daniel, I'm going to ask you, what gives you confidence? I know Georgia's been the class of college football the last couple of years, but what gives you confidence that Georgia can come into DKR and knock off the number one team in the country, the best team in the country, the Texas Longhorns? Yeah, it. uh yeah, you mentioned things are different than we thought it would be, and I and and initially I was like, well, no, they're not. We got two top five teams. Like we knew this was going to be an epic matchup, but yeah, the the roles are a little bit reversed. I think a lot of people might have thought, yeah, Texas might be two, three, four, you know, ranked, and Georgia might be number one coming into that game. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of what gives me confidence, um, listen, I think Georgia is getting better every week and i think while this georgia team is not the dominant 2021 2022 university of georgia football team that we've kind of gotten used to 
they're still a very talented football team. This Georgia team is littered with really talented players. I like the Georgia coaching staff. I like a lot of the things in terms of the matchups in this game um, against Texas. I picked Georgia to beat Texas in the preseason. Um, uh, I picked us to lose to Alabama, by the way, and I picked us to beat Texas um, in this game. And um, yeah, I think I still probably feel that way. But I mean, coming into this game, this is to me, this is a coin flip type game. I'd be curious to know if you if you feel differently, but this is truly like a it re, i mean it reminds me a lot of that ohio state oregon game we saw last weekend i'm not sure it's going to come down to the final play like that or be such a wild finish like that i would lo- you know it'd be great for college football if it did but that's the kind of feel of it it you know it's at texas but i think these teams are pretty evenly matched and um yeah i think it's just going to come down to who makes the plays who plays with you know the most composure and um, who's able to to maybe make one or two plays in the fourth quarter? Because I I expect this game to be tight going in, like coming down the stretch. Yeah, I think so too. You know, I just uh, I said on the SEC squad show, like I think this game is going to be 65, 70 points. You know, kind of similar to what we saw uh, in you know the Alabama and Georgia game a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think you know both offenses are going to put on a show. When you look at you know the Texas defense, I said it; they haven't faced a top seventy offense yet, and so Georgia and Carson Beck are certainly going to be the biggest test that they faced thus far. Uh, both teams evenly matched. Both teams are legitimate championship and SEC championship contenders. So, uh, yeah, I think you know when you look at this matchup, it's going to be you know tough on both sides. Two of the best teams in the country, and I really think it's going to go down to the wire. You know, I think it's going to end up with one team with the ball at the end of the game. And if they win, will be determined by whether they score a touchdown or not on that drive, kind of like Georgia at the end of the game against Alabama. You either score the touchdown and you go ahead for good, or you don't score the touchdown and the other team wins. So whether it's Texas with the ball at the end or whether it's Georgia with the ball at the end, I think the ability to put in that last touchdown, the team that has the ball last, will be able to win this gigantic matchup on October 19th between Texas and Georgia. I want to ask you, Daniel, because you talked about how this team may be more vulnerable than Georgia was in 2021 and 2022. And I was kind of thinking the same thing. You know, there are still a lot of good players on this team, but I don't know if you have the high end elite players that we're used to seeing, at least, you know, in those two years when you won the championship. Like who's the Brock Bowers? Who's the Lat McConkie? Who's the Jalen Carter or the Jordan Davis? Do you think this team has the high end talent? Is that the biggest difference between the 2021 and 2022 squads and this one, that there's just not as much like obvious NFL talent on this team? I don't I don't think it's quite that, but I think you're on the right track. So there's a lot of NFL talent on this team, but um, Georgia does lack some so far this year. Georgia has lacked some key difference makers in terms of college players that are able to to completely impact a game and i think you know you can go to guys um like like jordan davis or jalen carter or um you know all those you know Devonte wyatt and you know, go go down the list of all those guys that um were drafted off those two defenses but really it's in the back end where you see the big difference like georgia's georgia's solid at linebacker georgia's actually been pretty stout up front even without a a you know they don't have a first round pick on that defensive front but um they've they've actually been pretty stout um up front this year michael williams you know coming off the edge when he's healthy is that type of elite first round talent um it's in the back end where this Georgia defense has gotten exposed this year. And it's guys like Kamari Lassiter. It's guys like Keely Ringo. It's guys like Javon Bullard. Like those are the guys that Georgia has missed off those teams from years past that they haven't seemed to be able to replace. Obviously they've got Malachi Starks, who's one of the best safeties in the country, but he's kind of been on his own this year at times. A lot of the play from the corners has been suspect. And that's really when Georgia's gotten exposed this year, which, I mean, we're talking about a Georgia team being exposed that is five and one with their only loss coming at Alabama at night by, you know, by one score. Um, So 
when Georgia has gotten exposed, it's been in the secondary on the back end, which kind of brings me, Jonathan, to like, is that how Texas you imagine is going to try to attack like Sark and Quinn and the game plan? Are we going to try to go deep against this Georgia team? I know Texas is built for it. I know they've got the wideouts to do it. Is that how you imagine this Texas offense? We think both offenses are going to score, but is that how Texas is going to try to score in this game by trying to take some shots and go over the top on this Georgia defense? I think certainly, especially when you look at the way that Georgia plays defense, you know, you feel like you got some favorable matchups on the outside just because one, the corners haven't played well. I mean, you can expect that you're going to see a lot of man coverage. Right. And so you want to be able to, you know, take advantage of that with the Georgia Bulldogs. I think the two biggest questions in that regard for the Texas Longhorns are we saw Isaiah Bond go out early uh, in the Oklahoma game with a hamstring injury. He's been listed as day to day. How healthy will he be against the Georgia Bulldogs? Because he's probably your best deep threat. And then the other key to that is what version of Quinn Ewers do we see? Right. Because Quinn Ewers came back and probably played a C, you know, C plus B minus game against Oklahoma. Of course, it was enough to, you know, beat them 34 to three, but he wasn't sharp. Right. First couple of plays, missing wide open receivers through an interception, kind of getting sacked. And then they went to the short passing game, intermediate passing game, and he settled in. But he only threw for 199 yards in that game. So when you look at it, are we going to see the quarterback we saw against Michigan? Um, and earlier on in the season, that was kind of throwing the ball, you know, all over the field. Or is he going to struggle, right? Can Georgia get a pass rush on him, you know, get bodies on him? I'm not sure how he's still feeling from that oblique injury. They get him moving around in the pocket a little bit. They speed him up. And then if, you know, Quinn Ewers, because I believe this is going to come down to who plays better at the quarterback position, right? Same thing with Jalen Milrow and, you know, Carson Beck, where Jalen Milrow was just a little bit better than Carson Beck in that game. If, if, Quinn Ewers is not 100 percent. You know what I mean? If Quinn Ewers is not playing his best football, we just saw Carson Beck come off a game where he threw for 400 yards. So, you know, if he's not playing his best football, I think this Georgia defense can get to him, rattle him a little bit. And we haven't seen Texas be able to run the ball at an elite level this year. So, you know, I do think that we could be vulnerable at the quarterback position if we see the Quinn Ewers that we saw last week. So. Definitely think Sark, you know, wants to take advantage of that back end um, and try to go deep and try to get some explosive plays against that secondary. Uh, but like I said, it just all depends on what version of Quinn Ewer shows up in this game. Did look a little concerning last week against Oklahoma and how healthy is your best deep threat in Isaiah Bond, uh, you know, in this matchup. Hey, NFL fans, you can get. A big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, as we head into the meat of the NFL season. So when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, speaking of the middle, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place that first $5 bet. You can take aim at week seven in the NFL, the first game of the week between the Broncos and Saints has New Orleans as home dogs. FanDuel has the Broncos two and a half point favorites in this one. FanDuel has zero faith in these offenses too. The total is set at 36 and a half. That is, if you if you didn't know, that's low. That's that's like almost Iowa football low. So what are you waiting for? That's FanDuel.com to get started. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day? Have to turn down the volume with all that shouting? Make the switch to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all the screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you canvas analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What does this game mean to you, Tennessee, Alabama? You know, what it really means is like, sadly, it's the midway point of the season. I was at yeah. the game back in 1988 in Knoxville when Tennessee came into the game, I think, 0-5, and, and Alabama um, – comes in and beats them to take them to 0 and 6. Tennessee doesn't lose again until the next time they meet in the third Saturday of October game in Legion Field in 1989. And Alabama fans will remember that is the Saran Stacy explodes game. That's what Brett Mur- Musburger's call was. Um, but I was at both of those games. I, I mean, I've been to Knoxville a bunch of times to go check out uh, this contest. I always had a blast. Uh, I was there in 90. 
six in the rain when uh, Jay Graham took it uh, all the way. Like he, they, you, they were just trying to run the clock out yeah. and take it in overtime. And Jay Graham goes all the way. I was there in 94 when uh, Peyton Manning made his first appearance. And I've been to a lot of – I was there in 90 – what was it? 90 uh, – uh, shoot. 95 when Peyton Manning led the band mm-hmm. at the Legion Field. Um, so, I mean, I've been there for a lot of fun Alabama-Tennessee games. And it's always like the halfway point of the season. It's always like um, just a, a game that signifies, hey, we've already gone through half of this stuff. Uh-oh. I can't believe it. I don't – listen, I took some heat today uh, on the podcast because I've said, look, I don't feel about Tennessee – the way I feel about Auburn. But I grew up close to Auburn. I think Auburn's the main rival. I hate to even admit it, um, but it's true. And I I would rather beat Auburn than beat Tennessee 100% of the time. Now, Mm -hmm. that said, I appreciate the Alabama-Tennessee rivalry more than I appreciate a lot of other rivalries. But I get why some Alabama – I totally get why a lot of Alabama fans loathe Tennessee and mostly because of Phil Fulmer. I get it. But I'm just saying – I got over the Phil Fulmer stuff and winning about 15 in a row will help you get over it. I was going to say, so like, yeah, yeah, you know, my, my lifetime, it's been, you know, I remember as a kid, this, this series has always been a series of streaks. When I was a kid, man, it was Tennessee whipping Alabama's tail every single year. It wasn't 15 in a row, but I mean, it was, you know, four or five, you know, it's, and, and then it would go in the other direction for a little bit. Right. And then, of course, as you mentioned, 15 in a row with Nick Saban, um, you know, that, 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 that kind of stinks for people, especially in my age group. But, you know, it, it's funny, like, th- this is an absolute rivalry game. Um, you know, for Tennessee fans, it depends on, you know, what age group you ask. My grandfather says Vanderbilt Commodores. has got to be Vanderbilt every single time. Well, that's true, but is it really a rivalry game? My dad would tell you Alabama. I would tell you Florida. But, I mean, again, like, that was only a rivalry game since 92, and that's kind of been one-sided as well. So, um, I love this game, though. I think that... The history in college football, the history of these two programs, it's its super exciting. Um, Storyline so far for this season, man. I mean, obviously, 5-1, and 2-1, and one, both these teams kind of sit there. Both, the, both these teams have a loss that they didn't expect preseason. Tennessee at Arkansas, obviously Alabama at Vanderbilt. Take the floor, man. We all saw the, uh, the Georgia game. We all saw Alabama hold on, give it away, and then take it right back. And then we saw what happened the next week. The roller coaster season, first year post Nick Saban. How's it been so far? Uh, it's it's been just that a roller coaster. I mean, yeah. you beat Georgia, and, and the Georgia game in itself was a roller coaster, and it was just crazy. I mean, we didn't. I never thought we'd score twenty eight points on Georgia in that game, much less in the first, you know, quarter and a half. Yeah. Um, and then of course you Brian Williams, uh, who should be a senior in high school. Everybody knows seventeen. Yeah. Makes, yeah, he makes an unbelievable catch and uh, is able to you know, pirouette and then accelerate and beat two Georgia defensive backs. And I don't care if you're a Georgia defensive back, you're a dude. And um, he's able to beat them both to the end zone. And it it was crazy. Right. And then of course you have the Vanderbilt game, which felt so surreal. I was watching it with a bunch of Bama fans and it was, it was almost like, yeah, we're going to win this just, just any minute now. And then the next thing you know, we don't win it. And it's sort of like, uh, I felt like, um, the brothers in trading places, like turn those machines back on, you know? Um, but, and then of course, South Kakalaki, there we are. We score on the first drive, look good doing it. We had Ryan Williams open for a touchdown. Don't hit him deep. We miss him. And on uh, the second drive and next thing you know, South Carolina is right in the middle of it. Cause there's some boneheaded decisions. Alabama got a 15, well, uh, half the distance to the goal penalty because on a touchback, never even heard of that. No. Um, and so it put them on the 12 and a half still the 25, which led to a safety and just, you know, it, it was sort of a snowball effect. And then, you know, at the end of the game, you felt like, okay, Alabama's finally got this thing under control. They give up a fourth and nine for a touchdown. They uh, give up a, another long pass uh, for a touchdown to Nicholas Harbor, who is just a freakazoid, by the way. And then they uh, don't get the onside kick. It's just, there's been a lot of funky stuff going on with Alabama ever since Georgia. You know, it's kind of weird for Tennessee. Um, it, it's been a little bit of, you know, maybe at this point in the season, five and one expected, but how you got there has been very, very different, right? I mean, Josh Apple's offense, high scoring, tempo, tempo. I got news for you. This is going to be the slowest. At, um, if they continue pace of where they are right now, no pun intended, this will be the slowest Tennessee offense you've seen in the last three years. That Like tempo, they'll go tempo sometimes and they'll stop. They'll go tempo sometimes, then they'll slow it down. Like, I don't get it. Sometimes it's self-inflicting self, self uh, inflicting wounds like penalties or, you know, turnovers or whatever. But 
like they they've slowed it down this year and I don't think that's that's really good but nonetheless it's this offense that had such high expectations with quarterback Nico Iamaliava and the in conference play it, it, it's been non-existent it, it's been bad but the defense that we all thought was going to take a step this year and look pretty good it's been dominant and, and sure I I recognize it you know Arkansas Oklahoma NC State's Florida they're not winning any offensive awards this year I get it but you know, you said like whenever you get to Tennessee, Alabama, you truly are halfway point of the season. That just kind of dawned on me this week. Wow, Tennessee's played six games already. You kind of are who you are, right? I mean, yep. this defense is good. This defense is one of the best ones in the SEC, one of the best ones in the country. So it doesn't mean Alabama's not going to make some plays because Alabama will. Uh, but it's been kind of unique to see how the two sides of the football have operated. Now, I think Tennessee's offense, if you can protect your young quarterback, I think you're close. Uh, they they missed on a couple of down the field passes the other day that you know I heard you say on the SEC squad show like you know if if Milrow hit Williams on that one in the first quarter changes the game same thing for Tennessee absolutely changes the game but you didn't get it one constant's been Dylan Sanson he's been phenomenal this year so it's been a bit of a roller coaster as well but I I think for Alabama for Tennessee at this point in the season five and one you're like okay that's about what expected yeah I, I think. Some people, most everybody probably would have predicted, hey, both these teams come in here five and one. They just yep. wouldn't have expected the losses to be where they were, you know, to Vanderbilt and Arkansas. I don't mm -hmm. think people would have called that at all. So, um, in fact, I, I'm one of the fools that fell into the NC State trap. I thought at the beginning of the year, I was like, NC State, you know, Grayson McCall, this coach is pretty good. Their schedule sets up beautifully. If they get by Tennessee, I think they're, you know, they're, you know, right there in the playoff picture. Look, it looked good on paper. It looked good it on did. paper. So did Ole Miss. Yep, 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 yep. You're absolutely right. And, and again, I think the moral of the story is you are what you are at this point in the season, number one. But I think historically you are what you are, too. You know, like NC State, they might eventually make the playoff, sure. But I should have not fallen for the flash in the pan because they haven't shown enough no. to get there. I mean, in Tennessee humiliated them now. Other teams have humiliated them since then. I mean, uh, I forget who it was that beat them at home just recently. Like they, uh, boy, it was not not a great team. And they, they maybe was it Rutgers? I can't remember who beat them at home recently. And I was like, that they had the lead most of the game. They just can't finish anything. And then Clemson beat up on them pretty good. But you know, in the end, Tennessee and Alabama are still right here. And 